Let's hear some uh, post-match reaction from Gibraltar. Nathan caught up with Darren Randolph, Shane Duffy, Shawnee McGuire and the captain, Seamus Coleman. Uh, yeah, <coughs> coming here and getting away with three points was, was important. Obviously we would have liked it to be a little bit better or maybe more, more goals, but as you can see, even, even now the wind is... But look, I don't want to make excuses, it was the same for both teams and the pitch was the same for both teams, but it was a difficult game. The, the conditions were obviously absolutely crazy. Have you ever played in anything like that? Uh, probably underage, just about Donegal, somewhere <laughs> up about Guido or something like that um, on a Sunday morning. But no, as I said, it was the same for both teams, so I don't, I don't want to maybe look for excuses. It was tough, but same for both teams. And, you know, we got over the line. We definitely would have liked it to be more comfortable. I'm not going to try and butter it up any different. I'm, I'm not making excuses because obviously they had to play, they had to play the conditions as well. And, it was it was one of the worst I've played in to be honest. So uh, probably didn't look like that on the telly or or, or stuff like that. But um, job done really. Obviously we're a little bit disappointed that we didn't play a little bit better and let's, let's score a few more goals. But uh, three points to get out of here. In the dressing room afterwards, you just go, yeah, three points, job done, move on to Georgia. Or was there a bit of disappointment that you didn't take more control of the game and gave gave Gibraltar a chance in those final stages? No, we came here to get the win and, and that's what we did you know people can say say what they want but the to say from 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 uh, from the couch or, or looking on you know we want to come here get the win which we did uh it won't matter come the end of the group when we qualify how have you enjoyed the past week under mick yeah it's been good very good uh it's been uh we had actually had great weeks training in in, in the build-up to the to the game so um Everyone's been in, been in high spirits and uh, got off to a good start. To identify at this early stage why the performance maybe wasn't at the level you wanted? <laughs> Very early for a negative question, but um, no, look, uh, we came here, tough game. We knew it was going to be tough. Uh, getting out here with three points, we know all the fans, we wanted to put on a, bit, a better performance, but uh, Tuesday night we need to make sure that we do that. Do you come off the pitch then happy that you got your first competitive start or frustrated that you maybe weren't able to make the impact you wanted? More so than an impact that you know that I should be should be setting myself. Um, obviously, it's great to, to start from a country and for first competitive start. Um, you know, it's you know it's a great honour for for myself and for my family and stuff. But I thought it could have been a game where um, I could have saw myself getting my, my first goal, but it wasn't meant to be. Um, I'm sure. Um, hope well. Hopefully, there'll be, there'll be a chance to, to you know to, to get that first goal Tuesday night. Um, I particularly didn't really get many half sniffs, well, sniffs tonight. So, um, you know, I'm not a type of player that, that'll dwell on it too much. I'll, you know, gain confidence from, you know, picking up, picking up a win today and just moving on. Do you get a sense of the goodwill that's there towards you from the Ireland fans? I think everyone particularly identifies with you coming straight from the League of Ireland. They've been waiting for you to get your chance for quite a while. We're calling for it mm. for quite a while. Do you, is, is that something that resonates with you? Yeah, I think obviously you know people within Ireland want me to do well because I've come from the League of Ireland and then pushed on at Preston. Um, look, it's great to you know put in the green jersey and you know and play for your country um, out here and you know on the biggest stage in front of the best fans in the world. Um, you know, as I said, they particularly didn't play well or, or any anywhere near our best, and they were singing from the first to the last, and that's something that can make a real difference when. In, in a frustrating game like today um, and I've seen obviously 40,000 tickets have been already sold for the game Tuesday so obviously winning today can you know, br hopefully bring a, a full house um, Tuesday night Yeah, uh, I'd say it will be close enough I don't know how many tickets are sold I don't know what, what it's going to be like will it be close enough to a uh, full house? Hard to tell, isn't it? Like uh, under the previous management you would have said probably not and it'd be fairly easy to get tickets on today new management, new era and all that Closer to a sellout, I would imagine. Robbie Keane on the bench, who of course wasn't the top scorer in the uh, 2002 World Cup qualifying campaign. Well, he's got his work cut out for him now, doesn't he, over the, the next couple of months. If we're going to be stuck for attacking options up front to try and get something a little bit more from the likes of McGoldrick and Shawnee McGuire up front. Like, what is Robbie Keane going to do on a one-to-one -one basis? I'm sure it'll become a, a bit clearer over the next few months. It seemed that Terry Connor actually was in charge of a lot of the attacking movement last week uh, from a couple of the suggestions on the training park. But I'm sure Keane's influence will grow over time. Yeah, all right. I think we've got Nathan with us this morning, do we? Yeah, morning, lads. How are you doing? Very well. An uneventful trip to Gibraltar. You didn't get your picture of John Delaney under the VIP exit out first. Neil Reardon beat you to the punch. Uh, I was busy working. You know, we were, we were on air at the time, so I was uh, rushing back to see was there any breaking news. That was about half an hour before kickoff in the game. Yeah. 
uh, when word started to filter through that something was pretty seismic was maybe about to happen behind the scenes uh, regarding John Delaney. Nobody quite knew what it was. Was he, was he potentially even going to resign as CEO of the FAI? So obviously we uh, set off in chase of John Delaney and I found him just below that VIP exit sign. Uh, he had no comment to make at that stage. And it was just a, a bizarre evening for a whole manner of reasons from the game on the pitch and the hurricane force conditions and the plastic pitch and Ireland struggling to get over the line to, for a lot of the second half, keeping an eye on the director's box just to our right-hand side. And was John Delaney there? It was a bit slow to come back for the second half. He was on the phone a lot. He was up and he was down. And, and what was going on is, as again, word came through that there was going to be a statement later that evening and what exactly would be in it. So it was yet another one of those remarkable, strange FAI days that seem to crop up every couple of years. This is definitely right up there. Like, I mean, it's, it's not quite Saipan, but it's not like, it's certainly, it's right next to it in terms of um, what's going on because... Is it a corporate Saipan? Uh, it, f it feels a little bit like that, yeah. Um, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that you would issue a statement at the time that you did unless there was something else happening to force your hand. It doesn't make any sense to make these changes to the FAI's governance now in the uh, rushed manner in which they've been made unless there is something else forcing your hand, which we don't yet know about, which hasn't yet been established or hasn't been, um, been made public. So there is more to this story to come. And also that wasn't acknowledged in any way in this 1800 word statement. You're right. This is a seismic change at the top of Irish football. John Delaney has been the CEO for the last 14 years. We know the criticism that has been there in recent times. People wanted him to leave that role. And he's done that into this newly created role of executive vice president that just popped up out of nowhere. That this review of governance has been going on for the last six or seven weeks. And for some reason... The decision had to be made while a good chunk of the board are in Gibraltar on a Saturday night, that this is the exact moment that they need to make this change with no reference in those 18 words to any of the revelations that have come out over the past week. No clarity, no further answers to any of the questions that are being raised. It is all bizarre. It maybe does work from a PR point of view in that it moves the conversation on a little bit. Now, whether it will work only time will tell. But a lot of the conversations this morning are obviously about how much John Delaney is going to be paid, what exactly his new role is, who the new CEO will be, what they will be paid. Does the new CEO deserve to be paid 360 grand a year when, on the face of it, it seems that it's a very diminished role. It's not going to carry an awful lot of the same responsibilities that John Delaney had. So these are a lot of the questions that have been asked now regarding the governance side, whereas are people still asking, what about the 100 grand bridging loan? We still haven't got all the answers to that. Maybe when they go in front of the Oireachtas Committee, which John Delaney, it seems, is still going to lead, we might get some of those answers. But it feels as though we're putting an awful lot on an Oireachtas Committee that massively disappointed the last time John Delaney went in front of them. And has never, ever lived up to uh, its requirements as a government body. Let's, let's park the criticism of them for a minute because I actually think that the questions to the FAI shouldn't stop just because they say this new, um, new role is, is, is being created. Like, it, it's actually, I would say, still our role in the media to continue asking these questions in the meantime. Absolutely. And, and to keep that pressure up for the type of transparency which has plainly not been in evidence. If the FAI were undergoing uh, root and branch examination of their own corporate governance. They could have made that public when that was happening. They could have said, well, look, we actually believe that there is a better structure for us into the future. It may involve uh, a separation of powers from the current role that we have, where the chief executive is also heavily involved with UEFA business, while at the same time supposed to be running the grassroots of Irish football. If we split these two roles into somebody we're looking after Europe and somebody looking after the grassroots, this is something that we're considering. You put that out there, the consultation process, this guy comes over from the FA, who also apparently worked for the RFU and does his bit of work. But Sport Ireland have said, confirmed to the examiner today, they knew nothing about this corporate governance review, which apparently had already been completed to the point where it was ratified by the board of the FAI 
just uh, on Friday slash Saturday. That's still a little bit unclear in my mind exactly how that happened, but um, everything is too rushed. The, this just does not pass the smell test of this is a well planned out um, and it's on our terms a strategy. It, it just does not work no, like absolutely. that. absolutely. It, it's just over a week ago that anybody outside of the FAI found out about this review. And the only reason it came out was in a response to John Delaney, John Delaney taking out an injunction against the Sunday Times to try and stop this story about the 100,000 loan coming out. That is the only reason this governance review was made public. And we're to believe that within a week of the FAI deciding to make that public, that they convened a board meeting in Gibraltar to act out on it, that less than a week later, John Delaney is no longer the CEO of the FAI. It doesn't stack up. The timeline doesn't stack up when the FAI seem to be suggesting that it has got nothing to do with all these revelations of the past week. It's just too much of a coincidence. Yeah. Um, and so I think those questions will have to continue to be asked of the FAI. Of their uh, now new interim CEO, she, she can come out, come out and start answering these questions and say, look, I, I'm in charge now. It's my job to find out exactly what did happen. I will be reporting directly to the board and uh, I will be examining everything that's happened under the previous regime. I mean, that's exactly what John Delaney did when he came in. He was, um, oh, look, it's a new era of openness and transparency. Obviously, some of that transparency just doesn't seem to have been uh, followed through. So, um, you know, and I think there's a very important role for Sport Ireland to play here, for the minister to play. The public money will stop unless we get full transparency, and that includes the governance of the organisation. That includes you holding yourself to account in the way that you're supposed to have done in terms of the term limits for members of the board and all the boring stuff that a sports administration is supposed to do and should never actually be an issue for the public because it's really easy to do it properly. Do you believe Sport Ireland have the balls to do that? Do you believe Shane Ross has the balls to do that, to come out to the FAI that unless we get this set criteria followed in terms of transparency that we are going to stop funding? There's been little to suggest so far that they do. Well, the they, thing is, it's in the open now, so, I mean, it's, it's a win for any politician who actually wants to go and take this ball and run with it, no? You would hope so, and you would hope that, as you say, Jerry, I think there's a huge onus on the media to keep this story going, but that like, this is quite a legal issue now in ways. There's a complaint in with the Director of Corporate Enforcement. Obviously, Shane Ross and Sport Ireland seem to be in the dark about an awful lot of things that are going on here from, like, we've had a massive reorganization at the top of a national governing body that they knew nothing of until a statement was released on Saturday night. This new role has been created worth almost 100 grand a year in an association that less than two years ago had to take out bridging loans because they had cash flow problems. Like, how does this stack up in a tax, in a, in a, in a company, in an organization that is supported by the taxpayer? It quite simply doesn't. But it's happening, and it's happening right now. And who is going to step in and ask those appropriate questions and hold them to account? Nathan, when it comes to John Delaney's UEFA role, like, as we say, there's still a lot more questions to ask here before we actually get clarity, but there has been some suggestion that this may allow him to focus a bit more of his time on his role with UEFA at the moment. Granted, he's only been in the role a relatively short amount of time. Do we know what is the interest of his role with UEFA from an Irish perspective? Is it beneficial from an FAI's perspective to have a representative so well involved with UEFA? I, you would have to imagine it's hugely beneficial because UEFA is where the vast majority of the FAI's money is coming from right mm. now. There was mentioned in that statement that they're renegotiating again the TV rights deal that has got the FAI out of a massive hole because they're benefiting from all the bigger countries across Europe. There's no doubt that the FAI having a strong voice in UEFA can only be a good thing. John Delaney is obviously going to remain that strong voice because... They sort of changed the system in UEFA a few years back to make sure it wasn't an old boys club anymore and it needs to be a CEO or a president or a vice president that remains on these executive councils like John Delaney is. So he's going to keep that. And he, it was made clear that he's going to stay very much involved and leading the charge with UEFA, with FIFA, with any bids that are coming through with the Aviva Stadium. And again, that raises questions about the new CEO and how much power they're going to actually have. That's the good stuff. That's the sort of stuff that attracts a real high caliber applicant that you can look and be ambitious and think, well, I can get involved with UEFA. I can deal with FIFA. I can run the Aviva Stadium. I can take charge of the debt. Like These are the things that a high caliber candidate is going to want to get involved in. If you're saying, well, actually, that's John Delaney's gig, you can look after the League of Ireland and 
you can look after the FBI staff, but really, don't think you're going to get any of those nice trips to Neon because, hey, that's already done. Yeah, that's my job. It's literally my job, which I'm getting paid for by them and by the FBI at the same time. But these, anyway, we'll come back to that because obviously there's plenty of time for that to unfold and to unravel. Or maybe there isn't. Maybe this is the only week that we're ever actually going to get to talk about it. But I do want to ask you about the under-21s because uh, the Stephen Kenny era is up and running properly. Mm. Uh, you're at this game. What was the story? Yeah, I, th- I thought they were, they were quite impressive. Luxembourg weren't as bad as you might have expected. They had some decent results and they just sort of sat back and made it difficult. But it was clear that Stephen Kenny had gone out and given them the instruction that they wanted to keep possession of the ball and they haven't had a huge amount of time in training but there were definite signs of improvement I I saw a lot of the under 21s under Noel King and it was just an absolute mess an absolute mess there was no sign that they'd done anything on the training pitch but whereas the back four were very composed uh, I mean Connor Masterson I thought who with Liverpool was was outstanding just it was the game that suited them because Luxembourg sat back so he had plenty of time in possession of the ball he's got a brilliant range of passing just didn't look flustered ever, no matter what happened, except one occasion he got a yellow card for, for a rash challenge, but generally he controlled the show. Connor Coventry, who is an interesting player, played in the middle of midfield, sort of as the pivot, he got on the ball more than anybody else, didn't really make use of it. He's a West Ham midfielder, he's been on the bench a couple of times recently, and he was born in England. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Uh, so Connor Coventry is one of the few English-born players involved. The guys who impressed, Adam Ida, obviously up front, got a couple of goals. Uh, looks good, big, strong, physical player who can hold on to the ball. Sort of what Shawnee Maguire was talking about there of, of his problem is Maguire needs space in behind, which against lesser teams you're not going to get. There was none really for Ireland last night, but Ida was able to get himself involved. He was strong, bring the midfielders into it. And the way they were set up, there was wingers just off him. There was Neil Ferrugia making runs from deep. And Ida looks, looks an absolute talent. He's only 18 years of age. He's, he's with Norwich. He's scoring a lot of goals at under-23 level. And when you look at what Wales are doing at the moment and the way they fast-track these young players, I'm not saying Adam Ida should be starting for the senior team, but you'd wonder, do you just get these guys involved? Do you just want that bit of freshness, yeah. bit of energy? And that it's not that big a gap. And, I, I, and I, I don't think it will be over the next few years. But you might have seen the first goal was a header from a corner kick for Ida. It was a shame, really, because leading up to that corner kick, Ireland had a passage of about 40 passes where they just played it around, were patient, were patient, dragged it out. Masterson sent this crossfield ball, a little injection to pace, and the cross into the areas cut out for the corner. They score from the resulting corner kick. But there was just a good buzz around Tala as well yesterday. I'm sure people saw this nice moment when Jason Malumpy was coming off and Stephen Kenny grabs him and turns him to the crowd and says, basically, give it up for this guy. Look what this guy's done. And everyone goes crazy for it because, well, he was exceptional, almost scored, hit the crossbar, but also had this horrible time with injury. So this is obviously a huge amount of goodwill. It's the first match. They took this match on just to have a game. Most sides aren't starting their qualifiers till September but they go off to the Toulon tournament now where they're going to be really tested. All the European countries are going to be there. They'll have two or three weeks together and we might finally, by the end of that, I think we'll get a good sense of what Stephen Kenny has from them. All right, very, very briefly, we're completely out of time. You've been really good. Um, can we score for the Ireland-Georgia game tomorrow? Oh, oh, I don't know. I think it's... These two games, I think you just want six points. I would take... After the performance on Saturday, I would take a 1-0. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it, one hundred percent. What that? What you would take, and what's likely to happen? Do you give Georgia? Georgia are like some massive price for this game. And off air, a few of our colleagues have been speculating about the fact that uh, maybe Georgia might win this game. <laughs> well, they they're going to be a pain in the ass to play against. We saw that for Switzerland, even at home. I just think at home, the buzz that's around Nick McCarthy. There's going to be a big crowd. They're saying over forty thousand. That surely Ireland will have enough. If not, I. Like, don't want to be you don't want to be negative right at the start it's it's a disaster it's an <laughs> absolute disaster if they don't take six points from these two games good stuff no need to panic no need to panic a bit early for a negative question as uh Shavis coleman told you <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah bloody hell yeah tough tough crowd nathan good stuff thanks a million all right Talk to you.